should proceed. Wonderful. Ali, thank you so much for your invitation and for your introduction. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. It's a privilege for me, John Mitchell, to be speaking with you today. And uh, I look forward very much to presenting you some ideas around leadership style and profitability. And as Ali was saying, indeed, to uh, show uh, or to share with you rather your questions and to see uh, what interesting discussion we can have at the end. Um, I just want to try to take the screen sharing off the, uh, there we are, maybe that helps. Um. So, a pleasure to be working with you. Can you see the, the presentation clearly? Yes, we can indeed, so you can, you can proceed. I can move that. So, by way of quick introduction, and thank you, Ali, for uh, what you already um, shared with me, um, or shared with everybody. I'm John Mitchell, educated at Oxford, a thought leader on leadership and culture. Those are my books, and by way of additional piece of information, I can tell you I will be next in the Middle East in mid-July uh, in the Gulf area, if anybody, uh, as a result of this, would like to follow that through. Um, Mitchell Leadership Consulting is a boutique global leadership and business development consultancy with around 40 consultants around the world. Uh, as Ali kindly indicated, we provide global projects, mainly at the moment for European and USA clients, and we'd like to build more local clients in the Middle East and Asia and indeed the subcontinent. Um, and we can bring to bear what I will display a little bit, I think, to you today, cross-cultural intellectual property concepts and approaches. Uh, here, just my final introduction uh, to let you know who you are working with, this is uh, a kind testimonial from one of our clients, Alan and Overy, the law firm, which has uh, uh, branches all over the world, including uh, both uh, Riyadh and Dubai. He's kindly said that uh, programs for demanding professionals require high levels of intellectual credibility and an understanding of individual and collective challenges, and that working effectively across a global organization requires a developed cultural sensitivity. And in his view, he was kind enough to say that we bring that. What's our agenda for, to, for this next 40 minutes? Well, I think first, let's go to the question, what is leadership? It's an often asked question. Probably you all have your own answers um, and how it compares to management. We'll very briefly address that and give a quick concept around that. Secondly, how does leadership connect to profitability? This is a key question for most, if not all, of our clients, and I'd love to uh, develop that with you. What are the six styles of leadership? There are six styles which are quite well known. We'll explore that. And then, how does that help you to see what are your own default styles? Default styles meaning, if you're under pressure, what happens? What do you typically do? And which leadership styles are the most profitable? So I'll be sharing with you some research about that, from which you can draw your own conclusions. Um, and then we're going to talk also about levels of leadership quality and how the six styles connect to that. Then I'd like to offer you some practical examples of simple uh, cases of delegating and reviewing and how they can be different with the different styles. From that we'll draw some conclusions for senior managers and their organizations and I believe that most of you, if not all of you, are indeed senior managers in your organizations. Finally, uh, some thoughts on different approaches to professional leadership development with the question of profitability in mind. And then we'll go to the Q&A. And I look forward to such questions and would invite you to please uh, feel free to, to note any questions that come into your mind as we go along. And then we can explore those towards the end. What is leadership? Well, it's different from management. Uh, they usually overlap. Um, how can we see management? Well, in a way, management is the use and control of limited resources. There can be human resources and other resources. Uh, it could be money, it could be space, it could be technology, it could be buildings. And also we talk about human resources, which in some ways can also be a way of uh, 
making humans managed like any other resource. The confusion perhaps with the English language is that we start to talk about managing relationships or managing change, then actually we're starting to talk about leadership. Why? Because leadership ultimately is the quality of what are the well-known 360 degree relationships. Your relationship upwards with a superior or perhaps with a board or with shareholders if you're a very senior. Your relationship downwards with staff, people who look to you for traditional leadership. Also your peer group and also especially clients and even suppliers. So there are those different relationships. Very often leadership is only thought about or written about with the downward relationship in mind, the staff. We'll come to that. Um, but I think it doesn't take much thought to say if, if we uh, manage those relationships well, this will have an impact on profitability. First, let's say leadership can be reactive, active or creative. Three levels. And as we'll see in the rest of this presentation, all of those 360 relationships can actually be managed reactively, actively or creatively. And in the end, we'll find probably that there is a difference in relation to profitability. At level three, which is the highest level, the creative level, leadership creatively integrates the needs and aspirations of all stakeholders. And in a way, that's something we can have as an aspiration. And all three qualitative levels can exist at any management grades for a while. So we're not talking only about something at very top level, but the reality of the management and leadership culture in the organization. I say for a while, because as we might imagine, if level three exists at a low level, and level one exists at a senior level, then the level three people might not be terribly happy on a long base. On the other hand, if level three exists at senior level, and other parts of the organization are level one, they will bring it up to level two and so on to level three through the quality of leadership. I realize that creates questions. Uh, maybe some of them will be answered during the presentation. How does leadership connect to profitability? Well, in management, profit is a simple calculation, revenue less costs or in the professional service firms, the utilization uh, numbers and that kind of thing. Well, these are mostly when you look backwards. How do you create profitability looking forwards? Well, in leadership, profit is the result of excellent relationship management with and between clients, customers, staff, peer groups and superiors. And okay, we end up calculating profit in the management way. For a leader, the loss of a good client or a good staff member uh, or a good peer group member or the relationship with a superior, this is even a bigger loss and also profit likewise when we build those relationships because all these taken together will impact the financial result in a way that we'll see from research in a moment. Because of those two first bullets, we have to note perhaps humorously, perhaps not, that the finance director can therefore sometimes argue against investing in leadership development because there's a de definition that is different of what profit is and maybe one is looking backwards, one is looking forwards. Our research reveals that there are three clearly identifiable and distinct qualitative levels of leadership which we've already called passive, active and creative that apply in all 360 relationships and across cultures. And we'll see that creative leadership, as illustrated in this webinar, is likely the most profitable. So what are these six styles of leadership? Uh, and the well-known six styles of leadership were developed by Daniel Goleman and were published in the Harvard Business Review some years ago. It's important to note that these styles are only about the relationship with staff, the relationship downwards and do not take into account the other 360 relationships. And this is in common, as you may reflect, with actually most writing and talks about leadership. So now we're going to explore these six styles and then see how they relate to the three qualitative levels. Please study these styles closely and be ready to benefit by making an initial self-assessment 
of your current style or style. So as we think these through and look at them, maybe at the end I'll give you time to say which out of the six are the ones that you use most. The first one is called Affiliative. This one is most concerned with promoting friendly interactions. And as you can see, it places more emphasis on addressing others' personal needs than on goals and standards. It avoids confrontations around performance, wants always to be friendly, always everything in a good mood, and so on, rewarding personal characteristics more than job performance. So this is affiliative, and that's the first of the six leadership styles. The second one, very different, coercive, so forcing. This requires immediate compliance, often relies on negative corrective feedback and motivates by threat rather than through other methods. So this is what will happen to you if you don't do it. The third style is called pace setting. The pace setting leader leads by example and has high standards. At the same time, this leader may be apprehensive about delegating because of worry about the concern of quality and t can take responsibility away if high performance is not forthcoming. And a pace setting leader has little sympathy for poor performance. The fourth one, democratic. The democratic leader trusts that others can develop the appropriate direction for themselves and for the business, invites people to participate in decision making, holds meetings for that, listens to others' concerns, and rewards adequate performance. May not very often give uh, negative feedback. This is the democratic style. Number five, the coaching style. This is a style of leadership where the leader helps others to identify their strengths and weaknesses, encourages them to develop goals for themselves, will provide ongoing instruction as well as feedback, and may trade off immediate standards of performance for long-term development. And then finally, the visionary style, where the leader communicates a clear vision, engages people by explaining collective purpose and how this connects to their aspirations, and set standards and monitors performance in relation to the bigger picture. And as we'll see, the theory says that of these six uh, leadership styles, typically we have two that uh, are default styles of leadership, the ones that we are most comfortable with and fall back on under pressure. So here's the first question. What do you see as your own default styles out of those six? To remind you, there are the six, affiliative, coercive, pace setting, democratic, coaching, and visionary. And I invite you just to jot down, we'll, we'll go a little further later because you'll be able to see some examples and perhaps adjust your initial thought. I invite you to think about your own style, which are the two strongest or default styles that you show in your daily work. I will just add in something from one of our clients <laughs> while you're thinking about that. We had a lady who was uh, studying this kind of uh, leadership and she told us that initially she thought she was a coaching leader. Um, later when she learned more about it she realized she was politely coercive. We thought that was quite good fun. So please take a moment to note your thoughts and maybe you also might think how does that correlate to what others might uh, perceive to be your styles. And one thing uh, that's worth thinking about here is that we tend to judge ourselves by our intentions and other people by their actions. Well, other people, of course, they judge themselves by their intentions and they judge other people by their actions. So there may be a possible difference in how you see yourself and how others see yourself. So let's move on. Which styles are the most profitable? This is research by Hay Consulting, which shows that up to 28% of variance in financial results can be explained by differences in organizational climate. We'll explore what that is in a second. 
and also that 50 to 70 percent of variance in organizational climate can be explained by differences in leadership styles. They say also that while leaders need a range of styles, and they say actually at least four, ideally the whole six, two styles in particular contribute to the organizational climate that impacts financial results most profitably. And here is the uh, graph that they use. Now on the left there, down, going down, you see the different uh, leadership styles. Uh, I will just tell you that in this slide, visionary is represented as authoritative. Authoritative was the word that Daniel Goldman originally used, but he discovered that people confused it with authoritarian, which is not what it means. So now it's called visionary, but still in this slide it's shown as authoritative. Across the top you have the different components of what's called organizational climate. It stands to reason probably. Flexibility means how much room people have to introduce ideas and not be too much uh, stuck in that area. Responsibility, if they have the right uh, feeling that they can be responsible. Standards are high or low. Rewards, that means the rewards are regarded as being fair and connected to performance. Clarity is about what is expected of us and team commitment, the way that teams work together, the degree of trust and the degree of collaboration. So the red arrows going down mean that this, is, this leadership style is negative for that aspect of organizational climate. So for example, coercive is negative for flexibility. Coercive actually is, flex is negative for most of it. Um, where it's half and half, uh, there is a, a paler red uh, arrow going down and a pale green going up. If we look at authoritative, which means visionary, we'll see that for five out of the six, it is strongly positive, with flexibility 50-50. Um, Affiliative, so on. Affiliative is strong for some of them, but not good for standards or clarity. Democratic is good for flexibility and responsibility, but not good for standards, rewards, and clarity. Pace setting, also strong for standards, not good for the others. And coaching, the coaching style is regarded as, again, being strong for five of those, and 50% uh, strong for standards. So if you do a quick uh, view of those arrows, you'll see that the two which are regarded as being strongest for the culture or for the organizational climate are the authoritative, which means in our terminology the visionary, and the coaching styles. I'll give you a couple of seconds to, to focus a little more on that, and then we'll continue. Well, so connecting these six styles to the three levels, it started as follows. Level one, the passive style, actually is the affiliative and coercive styles. These styles are the least developed and are both reactive. Psychologically, both may have fear at their base to some extent. That doesn't mean we should never be affiliative or coercive. We'll explain in a moment how we can be usefully affiliative and coercive. Level two is where the democratic and pace setting styles fit. And these styles are more developed, they're more thought out, there's more intention about it. And then level three, the coaching and visionary styles. These styles require the highest development of awareness and skill. Usually they have to be learnt, as do the democratic and pace setting styles. It's, it's quite unusual to find people who are naturally gifted and do it perfectly, though it's possible. This is very important. As leadership styles develop from level one through three, each higher level includes and transcends the lower. For example, at level three, there may still be coercive and affiliative elements, but these will be much more intentional and skillful than in level one and conditioned by the bigger picture. So in other words, as we get more uh, skillful, more experienced in leadership, we still do those earlier things. It's just it's done better and in a more skillful way. So we can be affiliative where it produces a positive result without risking 
the negative results and even also coercive, which can be needed in some situations, especially survival situations. So going further now, um, I'd like to introduce to you a couple of examples which will illustrate what we've been talking about in theory so far. Um, and if I can have this working well, we will get there in a second. So to, to see how these uh, three levels differ in the example of delegating, would you please consider the following imaginary situation? You are Okay. And imagine yourself to be, if you would, the sales director of company X, doesn't matter what kind of company. You've just come from a board meeting where it was decided to aim for a 15% increase in revenue with zero increase in costs. You think that this can be achieved by increasing, should be increasing, the average daily sales calls by the sales staff from four calls to six. This means calls in person to customers or prospective customers. You're going to see your sales manager to communicate about this. How will you motivate your sales manager towards this? So I'm going to leave that with you for a couple of minutes so that you can note in brief what are the main things you will focus on to try to motivate the person. We don't know yet whether they will like this goal or not. What will you focus on to communicate that? So please take a couple of minutes. What is your four or five bullet points of how you will run this meeting? What will you say? What would you ask? So maybe you've already got a couple of ideas, you've started thinking. Let's look at how this question might be answered differently at the three different levels of leadership. So here's a level one response, a typical Level, response, level one response might be as follows. First, the leader does not choose to, or perhaps doesn't even think of, communicating the larger goal, about 15% increase in 0% cost, but simply imposes his or her own idea, coercively if necessary, for the route to the goal. So the leader there only talks about increasing the number of sales calls and imposes his or her own idea on how to achieve the objective without maybe even communicating the objective. And then to check might also, in an affiliative way, ask the question, is that all right with you? So it's a very simple meeting, quite reactive. Uh, the goal has come, the manager has had the idea and imposes it on the staff. If the sales manager disagrees with this way forward, or is upset about it, the level one leader will handle this reactively using either a coercive or an affiliative style. So it can be unpleasant or pleasant, but it will be reactive um, and we're not sure how that will impact the commitment and the engagement. Let's go ahead to a level two response. This might be as follows. <clears throat> The leader communicates the larger goal, so the 15% increase, the 0% increase in costs, and holds back his or her own idea for how this might be achieved to avoid blocking the sales manager's thinking. So the reason for holding it back is not simply, as some leaders do, to see if the sales manager comes up with the leader's own idea and then agrees with it. No, it's actually because if you ask them the question, maybe they will come up with even better ideas. So you hold back your own idea as a kind of fallback. So instead, the leader invites the sales manager to come up with ideas on how to achieve the goal. Maybe also involving the sales team too in thinking this through. 
And when that's done, later on, the sub-goals and follow-up are agreed and scheduled based on the ideas that emerge. So this has a democratic element, that the inviting of ideas for the root is part of the democratic style, and then the sub-goals and follow-up are part of the pace-setting style, going for standards, quality, making sure it happens. And then here's a level three response in this situation. A typical level three response might be this. The leader communicates the larger goal as for level two, and additionally gives the broader background on the reasons for the goal and the bigger picture. In addition to the invitation of ideas by the level two leader, the level three leader also asks the sales manager to focus on how the way forward could include innovation and learning by the sales team. So the full and open, well-planned communication of this bigger picture is part of the visionary style. The encouragement towards innovation and learning is part of the coaching style. So there we see in a very simple case, uh, perhaps, I hope not too simplistic, um, demonstration of how these levels of leadership uh, work in a practical way. I give you a moment now for personal reflection based on what we've just seen to consider which level of leadership your own thoughts were at the start of the exercise. What did they connect to most closely? Level one, level two, or level three? Please take a couple of seconds to think about that and check with the notes you made at the start of the exercise. And you can also see how that connects to your own default leadership styles as you provisionally analyze them a little while ago. Let's talk about review and appraisal meetings. Why? Because the Quality of, dis of leadership displayed in review or appraisal meetings, whether it's formal or informal, is one of the major impacts on organizational climate and therefore on profitability. The next few slides illustrate in broad outline these key differences. So, a level one leadership approach to review and appraisal meetings. In level one, there may be no formal review, so that the major task of human resources may become simply to make these happen. And then they may be done simply to satisfy the needs of form filling and compliance with administration. So if and when the meeting happens, <clears throat> the leader, the reviewer person, does all, all or most of the talking themselves and gives a series of judgments about past performance, especially focusing on negative aspects and areas of dissatisfaction. The reviewees per perceptions are not invited and the experience may well be demoralizing for the reviewee. So this meeting may also actually be used to air grievances or discuss mistakes or failings that were not managed previously and have been allowed to fester. And that's one of the reasons, of course, why people in the level one and even level two don't look forward to these meetings, whether they are the reviewer or the reviewee. Let's have a look at level two approach. In level two, the meeting happens regularly and it has two main goals. First, it's to provide an objective basis for compensation against hopefully some objective measures that were set previously. Secondly, it's to motivate the reviewee towards improvement. So in a level two approach to review, it's actually also a preview of the future. There is a look towards the future. The discussion includes the future as well as positive aspects of the past, praised and recognized by the reviewer, with the reviewee being invited to contribute his or her perceptions and doing at least 50% of the talking. The output of the meeting is a series of measurable objectives for the coming period, plus short-term review points against which to assess progress. And then we go to level three. In the level three approach, visionary coaching styles, 
The meeting is perceived as a routine process. Whether it's informal or formal, it's a routine process for, very important, connecting organizational need with individual capability and aspirations, which means that both of these have to be articulated, the organizational need and the individual's capability and aspirations. And the leader needs to know what both of these things are. So the approach will be similar to level two with the following additions and differences. First, the goals will include mastery goals, what they call mastery goals, for learning. Research around goal setting shows that these are much more productive than ordinary performance goals. This is very much part of the coaching style of leadership. And then any unsatisfactory performance will be routinely and positively managed in a timely way because the leader is skilled enough to do this positively and doesn't run away from addressing unsatisfactory performance. This means there will be no surprises in formal reviews and appraisals as they happen because the quality of all these elements is managed routinely through the year. So then following this exploration of delegating and reviewing in the different levels of leadership, please would you kindly take a few further moments to reflect on your own self-assessment as a leader and to note any questions that may be emerging in your mind for the Q&A session in a few minutes. What then are some of the conclusions we can draw from this for senior managers and their organizations? And essentially, it comes down to the possibility to increase profitability through leadership development. That leadership development is not seen as something separate from normal business that's somehow nice to do or a pleasant reward for good people. It's part of building the business. Hopefully it's now clear to you as listeners that there's a great potential to increase profitability and improve organizational climate by raising the quality of leadership. Many leaders, even at senior level, have reached their current positions as a result of being excellent in a different field, such as technical discipline or perhaps through building business. And they may not have been fully prepared for the role that they now have. An investment in professional leadership development can generate a cultural shift from level one or two to level three, and thus create a unique competitive advantage. Behind this is another aspect that we haven't investigated fully and, and cannot in this short time. The reality that the quality of leadership in a way determines the quality of the corporate or organizational culture. So that you can also talk about a culture level one, level two, level three. This is not about cultural differences between different uh, areas or regions in the world between different nations and so on. This is based on uh, psychological aspects that are there in all cultures throughout the world and the difference is in level to one, two or three based on awareness and the possibility of constructive action based on awareness. Here are some quick thoughts before we go to the Q&A on approaches to professional leadership development. And this is based on our experience as a consultancy over the last 20 years. We've identified 15 core interactions and 12 core leadership tools that underpin the transition from level one leadership to levels two and three. So these are the focus areas for development. In the examples we saw, we've already seen two core leadership interactions, delegating and reviewing. And we've seen how they differ between leadership levels. There are 13 additional core interactions within the 360 relationships of a leader. And they're not all, of course, um, connected with the, leader, with the relationship downwards. 
Some of them are with peer groups, some of them are towards a superior, and many of them are also towards clients. We've also explored brief examples of the 12 leadership tools, of three of them. Uh, those examples, questions, this is one of the leadership tools, different types of questions. Goal setting is a leadership tool, and preparation is very much a leadership tool. And one of the big differences between the different levels of leadership skill is knowing how to prepare for different kinds of interaction. So these 15 core interactions and their connection with the 12 core tools provide the primary content and focus in moving between levels 1, 2, and 3 and in raising leadership quality across an organization. A few further thoughts on this. If we're working to assimilate the 15 core interactions and 12 core tools, this impacts long-established personal and collective behavioral habits. Some of those may be very good in leadership, and some of them may not be so good. So one of the things uh, that's so useful in this kind of process is to find out what it is that works well when we do it, and what is it that causes us uh, perhaps difficulties as leaders. Because of this habit connection, uh, the most effective development approaches mix off-site sessions where there are blended learning approaches, lecture, exercises, discussions, etc. And implementation periods back in the workplace. In this way, habits can be gradually revealed, assessed, and developed over time. And without this extended approach, individual and collective habits are unlikely to evolve. And I'm sure that either you or people you know have been to very motivating leadership development sessions where it seemed wonderful at the time, but actually nothing changed afterwards. Why? Because there is an inertia or a momentum of ingrained habits, which is very hard to shift. So it needs a, uh, what we call a, a, a developed approach, a, a extended approach over time. Our experience with clients such as Microsoft and anyone is that a series of nine days is generally required to establish level three leadership across a period of a peer group of leaders. And it can be done nine days over nine months, separate days, or three sessions of three days with an interval of two to three months, or different structures within that. And individual coaching may be used as well. The important thing is that there should be gaps so that uh, leaders who are learning and raising their level can have an opportunity to experiment and practice back at the workplace. And actually, for the best results, the most senior levels should lead the way so that they can also guide the tailored implementation at lower levels. And this was very much the case in work we did both with Microsoft, just mentioned, and the law firm mentioned right at the beginning, uh, Alan and Obrey, and in most, if not all, of our leadership development work around the world. We are delighted to devote time to exploratory discussions about how such an approach can be introduced and tailored to new clients, which is why I invite you very much to um, get in touch if you would like to do so as a result of this session. So, this concludes the formal part of the webinar. It's been a pleasure to share with you these aspects and components of leadership and leadership development uh, in, in the context of bringing greater success to individual and, and organizations across different cultures. And I thank you all for your kind attention. If you so wish, I invite you to contact me personally at the email address, which will be on your screen in a moment. And please also feel free to browse our website, which has much more information and also videos. Now we invite you to bring forward your questions, and to coordinate this, I'm delighted to hand back to Mr. Ali Jafri. And thank you again, Ali, for your kind invitation to be part of this exchange. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, uh, it's been quite an interesting and comprehensive presentation you have given. So, folks, as we are now open for Q&A, if you have any questions, um, 
uh, you could either put your questions in the question box, I'll be happy to read them over, or if you want to speak to him directly, you could raise your hand. There is a hand icon on your webinar console, and I'll be happy to give you the opportunity to speak to John directly. I notice there are a few questions already posted in the box, so let me start reading them one by one. Um, uh, John, there's a question. Um, in your view, what is the most important relationship focus for a leader to build upon? Is it with internal stakeholders or external stakeholders? <laughs> well, what an interesting question. If you look at it very bluntly, um, what does the position that you have depend? What does it depend on? Who says yes or no to whether you stay? in your role. So the very blunt answer is that depending on your organization there's probably somebody above you, it might be the board, it might be another senior manager, who if that person is no longer satisfied with you, you lose all the other relationships. <laughs> so it's a very interesting question because most people who are leaders think the most important is to influence downwards and actually that's what they spend most of their time doing but if they lose the one above them, uh, then unless they are a kind of team that can take all the people with them, ethically or unethically, to some other company, that, that's the one you need to keep. So your most important client is, in a sense, your superior. At the same time, of course, the clients are, are very key because if we lose the clients, then your organization loses. But if you ask me to really say one thing, it has to be the person who is your own leader. Interesting. Thank you. Um, move to another question. Uh, uh, this question is, okay, it's about on the levels. Could you quickly touch upon again explaining the three levels and how you distinguish them uh, between management and leadership styles? Yes, with pleasure. Uh, and perhaps I'll just uh, allude also to the previous answer because there are different levels in how we can influence the, the superior. We can do it in a level one way, which is by somehow being very inferior and always uh, just running around doing orders. In the level two way, it starts to be a much more positive and active thing because we are offering solutions to the leader. And level three would go further in that. So the levels are about different levels of awareness and action that result from the awareness. Um, and you've seen, I think, in, in some of the examples about delegation and appraisal, those meetings can be completely different because of the level of intention that's brought to it uh, and because of the, uh, the quality of the communication um, which includes things like the quality of questions, the quality of acknowledgement, uh, the future orientation, so on and so forth. I'm pleased with the question because um, you may be able to think about not only yourself but also people around you about who is kind of passive in the relationship management, who is active. Um, and we have to remember also that some people are sometimes active but a little bit clumsy with it. So they might appear negative, but actually their heart is in a good place and wants to help. So leadership and management. Um, leaders are the people who create or help to create and to define what is the project, what is the way forward that then other people will manage. So, um, and in... in in some way, we have to, uh, I think, respectfully add the word, if I may, uh, inshallah, because we have to remember that we maybe cannot uh, be uh, the architects of our future. At the same time, uh, maybe there is a leadership effort to try and to be uh, of service and to connect all the higher levels that are important to us to the endeavor in front of us. Okay. Thank you. And it's good to know that you're, you're well versed with... Uh with the Arabic jargons and terminology of the inshallah also. <laughs> Thanks. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yes. Okay. Well, I think uh, it's very important. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a cultural sensitivities. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, we have another one from Brother Nebras. Uh, can you touch upon what should be the approach of the followers at these different levels? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, because there is this idea of, of leader and follower. Um, which level does this belong to? You know, uh, one of the very interesting aspects of the different levels, and you can find so many in all the books and all the research, so often it comes down to these three levels. Um, for example, even with children, we would think, well, there is a level of dependency. This might be level one, where a child or an employee is, is completely dependent on their parent or on their superior to help them to see what they have to do. Next level would be independent. So as a child becomes older, uh, more mature, moves towards adulthood, uh, they somehow are helped by their parents to become independent without losing the connection. And in the same way, a follower can start to become more autonomous, and that we would see more as level two. They're not so dependent on instruction. They have the possibility to bring in their own ideas and act on them. Level three is a much more mature relationship. We move from independence to interdependence, which is a conscious choice of independent people to, to work together interactively for a collective purpose. And that would be the level three in this. Uh, and maybe you can sense a connection between the different interactions that we've worked on or described here to how that inner attitude changes. So to be the kind of follower that is not somebody who never engages heart or mind but is just told what to do, to at level three the kind of follower who is a very active player and has become a leader themselves in their own way. Hello? Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Let me move to another question. Uh, we have people posting questions in the question box today, so let me read them over. It's about delegating. Uh, most of the times it is recommended that just tell them what to do rather than explaining how to do it. Is it really effective for a coaching leader style to continuously let them learn through some sort of on-job training? Absolutely. This is very much at the heart of, uh, of, of the coaching style. And one of the reasons that um, often it's thought, yes, just tell them what to do. Well, I, I, if you're distinguishing between tell them what to do and not how to do it, then that's already in a way towards a coaching style because you're asking them to work out how to do it. But one of the reasons that people don't delegate uh, what we call delegate the thinking so this is the question, are you delegating the task or are you, are you also delegating the thinking behind the task? This is the coaching style as well. One of the reasons we avoid it is because it's much quicker just to tell them. So this means you have to be sufficiently in control of your time and whatever the client needs, etc., that you can take, if you like, the luxury to give them the time to think it through and maybe check with you. And that way you can control if they're learning. But if you simply give them to work, uh, tell them, okay, go away, do that, uh, come back to me if you have a problem, well, if they're only going to come back to you with problems, they might not want to come back with you, to you at all. So that's a, so can you set up in the pace setting style, for example, an interaction where you say, come back and show me what you've prepared. And that gives you the opportunity to give them recognition and to see how they're learning. So uh, it's a very much linked also to how much under time pressure we are. Because the more we're under time pressure, the more we'll just tell them to do what they can already do and not introduce anything new for them. Okay. I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Thank you very much. Uh, another one. Uh, can you, I think it's a supplementary on the same delegation. Uh, can you explain what does actually delegating with authoritative means in respect to the authoritative style we learned today? Well, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because when you delegate work, what you're actually doing is creating somebody's working life. <laughs> it's an extraordinary thing to be doing, really. Um, 
in the authoritative sort of style, which is also the visionary style, um, it means that you're working also to increase the understanding. Because if you only delegate things that are repetitive, then either they will get bored eventually, or they will be comfortable with just repeating. And this is very dangerous if one day you're going to need to change things. So how to make the organization grow, how to make it alive, we need to cascade to people a sense of the purpose of what they're doing. Um, there are some quite amusing uh, anecdotes about this. Um, the one that comes to mind is actually an American one from NASA, the American Space, uh, Space Agency, where apparently a leadership consultant went one day and asked the janitor, asked, asked the person who was cleaning uh, the warehouse what he was doing. So, of course, if he was just focused on his activity, he would say, well, I'm cleaning this warehouse. Actually, his answer was, I'm helping to put a, a human being on the moon. <laughs> so how you see, uh, I don't know whether everybody is interested in moon and, and rockets and so on. You don't have to be. But the point is, um, how do we see our activity? Do we see it just as an activity on its own? Or do we see how it's connected to something which is the collective interest. And the visionary leader will try to create the sense of this is what we're all working together. This is your part of it. Um, and that helps an understanding to develop which can little by little help people to be more um, productive and solution oriented in, in providing the way forward for the organization. This is the general idea. Very interesting and indeed a very visionary style of, of the NASA example that you've given even at the tone level people understand where the vision is. So um, another interesting question uh, we have, uh, where does trust fits in the six styles of leadership and how important is that as a leader should have high intuition towards trust? Well what a, lo what a lovely question also and uh, I think that as you go up the le levels of leadership, um, the trust grows. Um, it, it connects again to delegation because do you trust people to try to do something they haven't done before? Now, one of the reasons that many tasks are not delegated is that the answer to that question is no. I don't trust them. They might not do it well. It's too much of a risk. So one of the skills with level two and level three is how do you break down the task so that you can check easily that they can do it well and then you don't have to take such a risk? One of the areas where trust breaks down uh, most frequently perhaps is at peer group level where personalities can be such that for some reason people dislike each other or else the leader above them is behaving in such a way that it's somehow divisive and they're not encouraged to be trusting. Uh, and it's even for people who are uh, instinctively trusting, it's difficult to be the initiator of that. It's much easier if you're given um, a context in which you can display that. So this, again, is a leadership challenge. How do you create the context in which people will learn to, to trust each other um, and to get to know each other in a way through working together that builds the trust? It's one of the, isn't it, if we look around the world and between nations as well, it's one of the biggest things that, that's hard because as soon as we feel suspicious about anybody, then some kind of unconscious fear can come in and we close down, we don't open up. And I think this is as true at, in the political level and the uh, international level as it is in the smallest organization. It's the same, uh, ultimately the same dynamics at work. Uh, and I appreciate that the, the question was asked because sometimes we have to reach out and make the first step and be ready to take a risk, to give something of ourselves. And when we do that, how astonishing it is that so often something good comes back. Um, and in a, in a way, people are waiting to be given the chance to show how they can trust, I think, very often. Interesting. I believe I had read uh, something interesting quotation on trust uh, where it said, uh, I don't know precisely, but the saying was something 
conflicts only exist because there's a trust in resolutions. So uh, that was very interesting. I remember I read somewhere. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, okay. That's a nice one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting and it's getting interactive. People are asking questions. So I think uh, since we're short of time, I can take about two more questions from the box. Uh, there's one from Brother Hamad al Saadi. What are the development approaches to move from one level to a higher level and how it is related to change management? Well, very interesting. Um, so I'll start with a couple of points made in the webinar and develop from that. The idea that um, it's probably not going to happen on its own by accident. It has to be, a, if you like, a conscious influence. So groups of managers need to spend time uh, with a coach who can help them with this. Um, it might be their own leader, if he or she can do that, if not an outside coach, working either one-to-one -one or in groups. And one of the wonderful things about working in groups is that people learn from watching each other learn. So, for example, with our clients, um, we might work with them in groups of 10, and over a period of, say, six months, um, one day per month, and at the end of the first day, each of the 10 would have something that they're going to work on in the next month. It will be different things for different people. They will make their own choices, but along um, similar lines, that are implicit in moving up the leadership ladder, if you like, towards democratic, towards pace setting, towards visionary, towards coaching. And then what happens on the next day, very interesting, for the first hour or so, they will each present back to, them, to, to the group what happened. Uh, and that means, first of all, there's a discipline for change. So we are managing the change of people's capability in leadership by creating a framework where they have to take accountability, come back and talk about what they did in connection to the decision they made at the previous session. And this can build, this can be like a turbo uh, engine where everybody gets a bit excited about each other's uh, uh, performance. I've just been doing exactly this with a scientist company called Environ in, in the United States. It's a global company where they work on scientific uh, projects um, and this is the other half of what they need to know to be to be excellent leaders and it's very uh, interesting to see how quickly they develop and um, support each other through this kind of change so managing change has two elements here one is we are managing the change in the level of leadership in the organization and one of the results of that is that they become better able to manage change within the organization. So if you like at level two, you can almost decide or rather define leadership as managing change. It's the normal role of a leader to be an agent of change. Whereas in level one, the underlying sense of responsibility may be different. Maybe just we have to keep things as they are somehow because that's what we're comfortable with. Whereas in level two, it really is understood. Yes, there are changes in the world. Are we going to be a victim of them, or are we going to initiate them ourselves and manage change? And when level two is fully adopted, that becomes something that people are capable with. And then with level three, it's also much more qualitative. Values, uh, the whole ethic, the, that there is a, um, a qualitative change that can be brought about in the organization through the quality of leadership and through the additional things that are put on the table and addressed as part of normal organizational life. I hope that isn't too uh, confused and complicated. But, uh, very interesting question. We need a whole day or two to discuss it. I'm afraid the sound has just changed and I couldn't catch that question properly. 
Okay, let me try to repeat. Oh. That's better. Is it better now? Yes, that's much better. Yes. Okay, the question is from Brother Mayman, uh, Zahid Mayman. Uh, it's uh, written from uh, Beijing Institute of Technology, China. The question is, how far leadership training has been successful in replacing or polishing the four styles? Could you please share your experiences? Uh, if I understood right, it's how, how far has leadership training been successful in, in replacing the leadership styles? So yeah, I'm the default styles, default leadership styles. Default styles, okay. Yes, very interesting. Um, it, is, it is very effective. Uh, and the reason is because time is given to, first of all, creating awareness of what our default styles are, because you can't really change something unless you can articulate it. So as these habits come into view, and the effect of them is seen, uh, almost, um, almost automatically uh, people see, ah yes, that's what I normally do, and I see now that this additional thing is also what I could do. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that the leadership to full stars are demolished, um, but they become more useful because, um, you know, Daniel Goleman, he gives uh, in his um, Harvard Business Review article, he makes a comparison with golf clubs. It's like if you are a golfer, and I hope some of you are, I hope you'll, that will mean something to you. Um, let's imagine you only have two or three clubs instead of the whole set of 13. This limits your capability because you have to use those two or three clubs for every situation. But actually there are many other clubs in the, in the golf club bag which would be useful to you if you, if you had them. Um, so it gives you more flexibility and you use your default styles much more productively in the situations where they, where they really help. So I would see it as an expansion rather than replacing one thing with another thing. It's not that kind of change. It's a growth. It's a growth of capability. And I hope that helps you. Well, it certainly was helpful. Um... Well, with that, I would like to, uh, I think it brings us towards the end of the webinar. Uh, folks, thank you very much. And especially, I would like to thank you, Mr. John Mitchell, on behalf of uh, Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, Mahat, for your time and uh, sharing this valuable information with our participants. Uh, uh, would you like to give any concluding remarks, sir? That's very kind of you, Ali. I would just like to echo your appreciation and say how much I've enjoyed and appreciated the opportunity to be with you all uh, virtually, as it were. I hope very much that you can, some of you, at least immediately find some uh, some steps you can take in your leadership. And uh, I, I thank you again, Ali, for your wonderful moderation of this webinar and for your invitation to take part. Thank you very much, sir, and uh, thank you once again uh, for your time. And um, folks, all of those who participated, uh, I also would like to thank you on uh, Miles' behalf for participating and uh, making it an interactive session. Um, and let me just quickly, uh, John, take over uh, your screen. Uh, I would like to show them a bit about the Miles community. Um, of course. So they can uh, sort of know exactly from where they can uh, see the archives or register for the new webinars. Folks, if you're seeing on your screen, uh, this is Mile Community, community.mile.org. You can always uh, learn more about our upcoming webinars and you can, in fact, access the archives uh, from the same page. Uh, we have a number of archive webinars. You can watch them on the YouTube. You can download their soft copy presentations. And uh, uh, this is where we will be uploading John's uh, webinar recording and we will be uh, in fact uh, uh, making uh, the soft copy available for download in the same section. Now with that I would like to thank you all once again and thank you especially John for your time and I will be ending this webinar so you will be all automatically.